when did you begin to uh, harbour ambitions of a career in music? I never had one. Never did. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, <clears throat> Howard and I, sort of like every young band in the 60s, sort of did it out of... Um, self-defense having a band was sort of a way to be recognized in high school and i don't think at the time we had any aspirations of doing anything with our career in music other than uh basically making friends and you know meeting girls and having something to do on the weekend so there was really never any aspirations past that because at the time there was no real music business per se it was just a bunch of bands sort of playing around um uh the the area that we lived in which was a uh, south bay of southern california was uh predominantly surfing music and uh, instrumental surfing music. So there was really um, no real aspirations, like I say. So we ended up sort of, <laughs> like most groups, um, having success by, by accident. After the Beatle invasion, there were a lot of um, record companies who came from the East Coast to the West Coast who were looking for young bands. And uh, we happen to be uh, the perfect place, you know, at the perfect time. Did uh, Howard and yourself have an instant rapport? Or was the working relationship strong right from the start? Well, our band was really just a bunch of kids from high school. Four of us actually sang in the choir at high school. And that sort of became the thing that tied us all together was our relationship in choir and um, the band was uh, a band of six guys and four of us were all from the same high school so our rapport was sort of based on the relationship we had as high school friends so yeah I would say our mine and Howard's rapport um, began to get stronger because we were sort of delegated the front men because we did most of the singing. And and because of that, we both also played saxophone. Uh, so there was a rapport almost instantaneously built because of that. Now, you were the Crossfires of that early days, weren't you? Yes, that was the band name. We were known as the Crossfires. And we actually had recorded and released records as the Crossfires, two songs uh, actually recorded and released. And then eventually, in the United States, uh, Rhino Records re-released uh, re not only the singles, but an entire album of material that the group had recorded. What prompted the transition from the Crossfires to the Turtles, and did you have in mind a particular musical direction you were going to take with that transition? Um, what prompted it was really, um, it, we were prompted. We, high school was ending. Uh, two members of our band uh, were already into the working rea reality of it was they were in the working place. One of them actually was married and had a child within a, one year of leaving high school. And we were beginning to realize that the amount of money that we were making as a band was not enough to survive for them. And um, we were on the end of what we felt was the end of this first run and we're basically breaking up because the people we were working with within the band who were out in the workplace needed to concentrate solely on making a living as a family man and so the band was really at that point um, this was about three months after high school for all of us. We were all just sort of graduating, and the band was really at that point breaking up when two fellas were 
at the nightclub we were working at and had heard us performing um, harmony singing songs, much uh, mostly songs that were the hit songs of the day, including, you know, Mr. Tambourine Man was becoming um, the foundation of a whole new sound of music, kind of a folk rock sound. And after the show, they came up to us um, and offered us a chance to go into the recording studio to record. Uh, and we took the opportunity, sort of as a last ditch attempt to maybe do anything other than approach real life. And um, we had had experience in the recording studio with the crossfire, so going up to Los Angeles, Hollywood, and, and recording, the, the main difference is that we were put together with our first influence was probably our first producer, who was a guy named Bones Howe. And Bones Howe was uh, fairly successful, having worked with Johnny Rivers at the time and a few other bands. Um, and Bones immediately uh, came in and began organizing our sound around what we did naturally, which was sing and play electric guitars. And um, it was a it was a really really surprise. I mean, we were like I say on the verge of breaking up when this happened. So it was it was a big surprise when the first single got released in the United States. Uh, as part of the first three recordings that we had, um, one of them was released, Bob Dylan's It Ain't Me Babe, which became an overnight, virtually overnight hit song for us. Was there much deliberation in, in deciding on that song to be your debut single? Not by the band. Um, it was pretty much released by the record company, at their choosing, we sort of had what we've done, had picked that song to record um, as part of three songs. The other two songs were original songs, and they picked the Bob Dylan song, I think, mainly because of the fact that it <coughs> was kind of writing on the crest of the Bob Dylan mania that was sort of happening with Cher had All You Really Want to Do and the Birds had Mr. Tambourine Man and um, he was so popular that it almost, the two things together, a folk rock electric version of one of his songs coming to the radio with his name involved almost immediately would conjure up radio airplay. When you were choosing songs to cover with the Turtles, how important was it that you when arranging the song to put your own stamp on it rather than sounding too much like the original? Well, we were um, we were all very involved in the organization of the Turtles' music. Um, that was from the inception of the band to the end. One of the things that we did stay involved in was the arrangements and organization of our music unlike many of our uh, many of our you know uh, groups from that era who also grew up in the same area and in the Hollywood band scene uh, we were one of the few bands that actually performed our records um um, it's no secret that most of the recordings made by groups like the Mamas and Papas, the Beach Boys, uh, the Birds, Paul Revere and the Raiders, and so forth and so on, that most of the bands were um, being recorded as studio musicians, um, mainly because record companies couldn't couldn't risk uh, having these bands make their records themselves um, because of the cost factors involved. So we were one of the few bands. There, I guess there was a, a positive and a negative. Having an independent record company at the time 
which was White Whale Records, a very small independent record company, which really was a, a negative thing in terms of reaching the marketplace. But the positive thing was that we were able to sort of commandeer the ship. We were sort of able to see that the value of having a small record label allowed us to take over the, you know, we sort of were like the inmates running the insane asylum. <laughs> and um, I think the Turtles saw this as uh, a very positive uh, situation that we took advantage of almost every turn of our career. And that's why the Turtles are one of the only bands from California during that time making the types of records we made where we actually played on all of our hit songs, the the actual band members, and never used any session players other than for special things like strings or tack piano or for something that we needed specifically done, which we couldn't do. Uh, it was not beyond us to bring in somebody to work with us on the project. How hard was uh, life on the road in those days? I believe you're involved in some of those uh, package tours, such as the Clark's uh, Caravan of Stars. Were they extra hard work? Not like the kind of hard work it became later. Um, the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars, I suppose the, the hardest thing about those early package tours, and we were on a significant amount of those in the first year and a half or even up until about 1960, well, late 66. Um, the, the hardest work was really the amount of days you were gone and the amount of time you spent sleeping and riding on a bus. Um, unlike later in our career where we became financially responsible for our tours, and it became hard in a different respect in terms of organizing the tours, which was a, was probably the hardest part of getting out on the road, is all the organization it takes in terms of trucks, buses, airfares, flying, costs, sound, lights, and so forth. On those early package tours, the hard part, as I say, was the actual length of time spent doing it. The easy part was that it was all done for you. Uh, the packages were pretty much organized and assembled by large companies. Uh, the per sound and lights was all provided. The hotels were all booked in advance. So you can kind of see that there was uh, a plus and a minus in that area, too. So what happened for us? was it became a situation as the, the more successful we did become, uh, the harder it, it, came, it became for us to uh, sort of take care of our business, and that was the hardest part. I think I read somewhere that uh, Happy Together was a song that you held aside for a while, waiting for the, the right time when you felt you particularly needed a hit. Is that right? Well, yes, when Happy Together came, we were in a very, um, it was a very interesting time in the Turtles career. We had basically gone about six to eight months where we were uh, unable to crack the recording marketplace in terms of top ten records. We, we basically were struggling along with um, releases that were re be had become regional hits for us, but had failed to crack the top 20. And so when Happy Together was uh, sort of discovered in a pile of records sent to us by some outside songwriters and we chose to record it, I think we were a bit gun shy for a few reasons. I think Happy Together had been turned down by a, two or three other bands and we were slightly concerned that maybe we weren't hearing something that they heard that would make it a negative um, it seemed like it was a really good song 
So we took it out on the road and played it for a few tours um, so that we could sort of get the feedback of the uh, the live concert audiences. And um, we saw a real positive reaction to the song and felt that it was worth taking in to record. And um, took it in to record, and it almost... I mean, almost immediately was um, something we saw that we had made the right choice uh, in in at least holding the song off and per- performing it so that we could kind of get a feel for the thing. And um, it became uh, uh, the right move for all of us. How heavy was the pressure from record companies at the time to, to keep the hits coming? Well, that was a significant situation because again unlike other artists from our era here was one again one of the negatives of being on a small independent record company who relied on our uh, single success uh, to continue to survive and it it, it played a uh, havoc on our ability to um, extend into more creative areas as albums. The album Radio Marketplace became more significant to the music business and the music scene and um, that kind of counterculture that was beginning to happen out of areas like New York and primarily San Francisco where there was a huge uprising of drug-tinged psychedelia sort of happening. There was a um, uh, an era in radio and music that was beginning to surface that band, a band like the Turtles was going to have trouble succeeding in. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that our record company was unable to allow us to... Uh, experiment musically and creatively as the band wanted to Um, and that was a terrible situation because again here was a small label that that survived entirely uh, on the hit single making of the turtles and um I mean, following the career of that label, they never had any other artists having hit singles that would allow us a little room to develop artistically. So that was a battle that we fought with this small company from about 1967 to the end of our career with them. We were with the same record company for five years. and. So that was probably the foundation problem that would eventually create the demise of not only their record company, but the Turtles themselves. So there was a real feeling of uh, that was inevitable that the band was eventually going to break. Well, I mean, it's inevitable today when bands form that they're going to break. I mean, every band that starts starts immediately has to understand that it's going to break up. I mean, that's, that's just something that is inherent in the pop music scene. Um, it, I don't think we understood that in 1965 because coming out of high school, the reality of the music business was not so much like it is today which is pretty much cut and dry, industry oriented. Um, it isn't so much a, a place for young, young minds to survive in terms of creativity. Um, it's, a, it's a corporate situation that unfortunately seems to run the music business and uh, that that didn't uh, um, that didn't um, for us during that period of time in our life, we just were not aware uh, or just were so 
kind of innocence to that type of um, structure that we didn't understand the disadvantages that, by, I mean, we had no clue really to the music business. There were no books about how to manage yourself. There were no books about the, you know, handbooks on how to survive in the music business about publishing. There were no industry oriented career concepts, uh, like there are today. Um, you just were a band making records and, uh, when you broke up, somebody owned your masters and your songs, and you just had no idea that they were of value. And um, so, I mean, that that was kind of the sad turnaround of many of the artists from the 50s and 60s, and probably still continues with some bands today. I guess I'll be right in saying that uh, you took a greater control of the business side of your careers when you went into the, the Flo and Eddie albums. Well, yes, I would say that by the time that the uh, Turtles uh, came apart in 1970 and um, we went into a four-year litigation over conflicts of ownership and name and a lot of business things that you had to learn about almost immediately, by the time the litigation ended in 1974... And we had already, at that point, spent two years with Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention and yet another concept of the music business that would lead us into Flo and Eddie. And as Flo and Eddie, we learned at that point that we wanted to run our career much more as a business and, a, and constructed our industry much like the way Frank Zappa had organized his business, which was Frank was the sole proprietor and owner, and everyone around him was all hired. And that was and still remains the way that our corporate structures have changed from the 1960s, where it was more of a democratic um, musical society. Everybody was involved in every possible decision making that took place and that that ended by 1972 1973 when you uh, set out making the flow and Eddie albums did you have a particular notion of the audience that you were you were hoping to reach there not really the record company did but we didn't um and there was a lot of confusion um musically and um image-wise in terms of, I think there was a lot of conflict of image by leaving the Mothers of Invention and recording our first records, which were more back to the structure and musical sense of the Turtles. We were sort of bucking again the system. The record company was sort of looking for us to perpetuate the kind of outrageousness that we had created while working with Frank Zappa. And we were looking to move towards a more musical foundation and kind of become more uh, respected, let's say, by our peers for our musical sense than what we had done with Frank, which was much more of a comedy band situation mm. and we were sort of running away from the comedy band uh, sensationalism of the mothers of invention and so the first two records we made uh, for Warner Brothers the fluorescent leech and Eddie the first record and then just the shortened flow and Eddie second album which was produced by Bob Ezrin um, those became records that were sort of recorded within a period of time when we were kind of making some sort of transition musically and structurally to the image of our live show too and our live show which sort of uh, survived within the more comedic elements of our Zappa era along with 
the musical tendencies of the Turtles and Flo and Eddie was not the same as the records we were making. Our records were basically full-on musical records, except for maybe one or two pieces of music. Up until the third Flo and Eddie album, which was a live album uh, primarily called Illegal, Immoral, and Fattening, uh, which came out of our live concert show. And that album um, did a lot to, to completely uh, upset the apple cart yet again, because what happened was we were m moving musically on record back to more of a Turtles style, and when our third album of Illegal and Moral and Fattening came out, it sort of sent the message once again that we were singing a more comedic, X-rated, underground-oriented musical uh, situation. And I think it was the main problem, especially in the United States, was that that record contained a lot of um, um, parts in it that needed to be listened by the rec radio programmers and um, to to make sure that they weren't playing anything that might be uh, construed as X-rated. And, I mean, it had a warning on the record, one of the first that were released with a warning. And what it did is it immediately sent a red flare up to, you know, not play this. And uh, that, that, I believe, really kind of sent us backwards again. Against you. You've involved yourself in a lot of uh, backup vocal work after the Turtles, too. That must have been a particularly enjoyable time for you, away from the pressures that, that the Turtles had brought you in its later years? Absolutely true. In, 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 in including... The, the time spent with Frank Zappa, I mean, um, those were very much, they were stressful, but in different ways. I mean, working with Frank, uh, we learned that you could be kind of a sideman within the success of a group. And that sort of continued with our involvement with Mark Bolin and T-Rex which Mark Bolin, um, we became involved in on his first transition out of his acoustic-based music, which we had be become friends because of our fan um, fandom. I mean, we were just incredible fans of the early records that Mark made as an acoustic duo along with Steve Took and kind of made it a point to sort of search him out and meet him because we felt uh, kind of akin to him because it was music that really struck a nerve in Howard and I, the early Prophet Seekers Sage records and My my Children Were Fair with, and on and on. I mean, his early records, which were not really that successful for him. And as he began making the transition to rock and roll as a guitar player and as a pop celebrity we were right there and um, mark began to bring howard and i in as a part of his image making and music, music building in terms of what he wanted to build for him as a foundation musically so uh howard were i were a uh, I'm sorry. I'll pick up right there. Can you do that? Yeah. Hang on. Sure. Okay, can I just continue? You sure can, yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, we can fix that. What? At that point, we became very involved with Mark in the transition of where Mark wanted to go musically, which was a much more... Uh, rock and roll based music and so what happened was we started working on a record with Mark called Hot Love out of an album uh, called just purely T-Rex which also featured uh, a song we sang on called Seagull Woman but Hot Love was a single that became T-Rex first record and at the time Mark pretty much 
treated Howard and I as a part of the band, um, up to and including uh, Jeepster, we were pretty much a part of the recording life of T-Rex because Mark had found a sound with the record Hot Love that would eventually take us into a very, very um, uh, intricate part of the structure of the band T-Rex, and that would include uh, subsequent recordings with Mark that were all top ten records, which were Bang a Gong, Get It On, um, New York City, Metal Guru, and there was a tremendous amount of hit making done around the sound that Mark created involving Flo and Eddie. So it almost was uh, another whole group for us. And even yeah. though we weren't a part of the touring business, and Mark wasn't at that particular time doing a lot of touring. He was more involved in the recording. Uh, he hadn't really gotten into the touring till after Electric Warrior, which really became the big the big change for Mark and sort of kind of divided us because as he became a recording touring band, we were sort of uh, moving on into our own life of music while he was becoming the international superstar that he would have finally become. Absolutely. And yes, working on anyone's record, uh, I, I think some people... I mean, Howard and I are just re tremendous fans of rock and roll. Uh, I mean, pop music and Broadway and comedy records. And from the f growing up in our families, we both were influences. Uh, both of our influences come from such a wide range of musical backgrounds. Everything from, you know, Louis Prima and Keeley Smith to Stan Freeberg to uh, Bud and Travis. Um, and... Um, we we both rely on that a lot for why we get involved in so many different uh, background projects too. I mean, we've sung with everyone from you know Mark Boland to Ozzy Osbourne to such phenomenal singing stars as Darlene Love, and um, and I say that we do that a lot because of just being fans and getting to work with. Producers in the studio also gave us some great friendships and foundations to kind of uh, look at ourselves as getting this education and getting paid for it. So it, that's always been a highlight for us. Now, the, the working partnership between yourself and Howard, I mean, it's survived for so long now, and it, it's quite rare to, to see a partnership survive for so long. What would be the, the key to that survival? I'm sure there's been heaps of ups and downs during that time. Well... Uh, I sometimes wonder myself. <laughs> I, I mean, we have a we've been together now for 37 years, and have actually sung now for four decades. We've been making music. If you even say 1962 was the upsurge of the crossfires, we we literally are four decades of music history, and our friendship, like I say, is uh, 37 years of not only just being friends, but working business partners, singers together, very close. Um, I, I believe one of the things that we've always um, relied on, uh, there's a couple things. I think one of them is just the credibility of respect for each other in terms of listening to what the other person's feelings um, are saying about yes or no on projects, and um, the other one would would have to do a lot with the fact that we've allowed each of us to remain individuals within the context of a group. So it allowed each of us to develop individually um, in areas that we wanted to explore as individuals and never got in the way of our what we do as a business, which is uh, to continue the touring uh, and to play and um, sort of our kind of coming into our own, realizing what the turtles sort of 
how they fit into the history of rock and roll, uh, and even bigger than that, I think, is by being with the Turtles and all of the other elements we've been as Flo and Eddie, as Mark Volman and Howard Kalin, uh, we're realizing that it's, that it's really those two people at the, at the bottom of it all, and that they are the re- reason there was a Turtles, and why Flo and Eddie went into the Mothers of Invention, and why there was a Flo and Eddie at all, was because of... You know, this sounds so schizophrenic, you know? <laughs> but we sort of sort of look at everything we've done as from outside of it, and we sort of succeed and survive because of that. I think we're always able to make decisions looking at the best thing to do for Flo and Eddie, not maybe for Mark and Howard, yeah. but what's the best thing to do in relationship to the history of the Turtles? Do we want to do certain things? Because I think Frank Zappa, while working with Frank, we had a very sort of revelation in terms of creating a philosophy. I think every human being has to have some sort of philosophy to exist in this time that we are given on this earth. And I think Howard and I realized that the concept that Frank sort of worked under as a man, as a human being, which we, I feel, sort of adapted ourselves, was that a lifelong career is what we're involved in here and that there's no reason to take any individual part of that career and review what we've done that when you look at mark volman and howard kalen and it's 37 year friendship you have to look at all of the elements together and and at that point it becomes pretty uh, pretty overwhelming because it isn't just uh, one record like Happy Together, and it isn't just a, a project like The Mothers of Invention, and it isn't just the Flo and Eddie records or singing background with all those people or making records for TV or any of the things we've done in radio and on and on. I think it's a culmination of all of those things that, make our career something to sort of marvel at. I, I, I think it's what keeps people coming back to us and being interested. I have this really weird feeling. Every, every time I kind of begin to talk about it when we do interviews and things, I have this really weird suspicion that there's something greater still happening ahead of us. Mm-hmm. And that all of the things that we are have been a part of and that what we've done for all of this is sort of a groundwork for the for the friendship we have. And there's something bigger about all this than just that we made a bunch of hit records. And I think that's the thing that Frank made us realize is that you can't really judge our career yet. I think it has to be judged maybe when we finally stop doing what we've done for so long, then maybe you can look at it and go, my goodness gracious, this guy is like, they've done all this stuff. How come we don't, you know, know about them? You know, there's almost like this thing of that we haven't even been given that kind of do because it's, we've never really run around pointing at ourselves and, and we've, We've just sort of let it all happen naturally, and and because of that, it's been uh, it's just continues, and it's still fun, and that's a real important part of what we got involved in music for in 1962 was that it was fun, and it's always evolving, and and um, that that's really that's really the thing I think. And we're sure it will continue to continue. <laughs> it's a mark. I mean, it, it always amazes me when I when I start getting this 
looking at it from out here that it not only continues, but I mean, ahead of us this summer alone, we're going to be doing 50 to 60 United States concerts and major touring theater venues all over the United States from places from 3,000 to 30,000. And they're using one of our major hit songs now um, to uh, as part of a television um, marketing campaign that has brought us a lot of really a lot of people uh, see it and it kind of continues the legacy in a whole nother fashion of turning on younger fans yet to the music because they hear your songs being used in television or in feature films and it opens up a whole new world of young young record buying people and our records still continue to sell all over the world. Um, uh, we probably sell thirty to 50,000 greatest hits albums every year and play to almost a million people on, a, on any given, uh, you know, year of touring. So it's a pretty, it's pretty much continues and it's, um, it's uh, the, the only thing, the only area where we regret that we can't seem to make the move back into is making records and that is a situation that we sort of don't have control of anymore because unfortunately the dynamics of radio programming and the concept of consulting in radio has become sort of enigma in terms of older bands like us having a place to make records so to find a place in radio for it to be played. And that's one of the phenomena of radio programming that sort of revolves around, um, obviously, money. And there's more money to be made make selling and making music for the record-buying public, which is basically kids 16 to 25 years old, maybe. So, unfortunately really fine pop bands and i'm even including the turtles in that but i mean fine great recording artists like hall and oats in chicago and the beach boys and really wonderful bands can't find record labels okay mark well i'll better let you go and get back to your uh, recording session there thanks again for your time it's uh, a pleasure to speak to someone still bursting with enthusiasm for their music after all these years and I uh, hope we get to uh, catch you down under again in the near future. I hope so, too. Thank you very much. All the best. You take care. All the best. Bye-bye. Peace.